Welcome to HR Voices. A podcast for independent HR and people professionals and the businesses they support. HR Voices is brought to you by the expert team at HR Independence Limited. We hope you enjoy. Hello. Welcome to the HR Voices podcast. I am your host, Mary Asante. Sadly, I haven't got my co-host, Charlotte Orfrey, with me today but I will try as much as possible, as best as I can, to do the show justice today. Right, I have the amazing Lucinda Carney with me today. Hi, Lucinda. Hi, Mary, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for coming. Lucinda is one of HR Independence uh, Partners, and she's been an absolute supporter uh, and cheerleader from day one. So thank you, Lucinda, for being there for HRI and okay. for sticking with us as our journey evolves and we go through our journey. It's my absolute pleasure to have you here because you host HR Uprising podcast and I have been a guest a couple of times on your show. So it's amazing to have you on mine. So welcome. Thank you. So for um, our audience, our listeners and our viewers, can you briefly introduce yourself? Thanks, Mary. Yes, so my name is Lucinda Carney. I am the host of the HR Uprising podcast. I run a business called Actus, which uh, provides performance management software, performance management, talent management software. My background in terms of HR background is I'm learning and development specialist. So I spent many years in learning and organisational development roles. And I'm a charter psychologist. So that's where my heart is in terms of OD. Excellent. Thank you. So for today, we'll be talking about performance management and how businesses can use performance management as a strategic tool to improve performance and of the individuals and invariably of the business as a whole. So I always like demystifying buzzwords when we have this show, because I'm very conscious that we do use loads of jargons in HR. And sometimes for some people listening, they kind of go, oh, what is that then? And performance management specifically, we know it gets used interchangeably a lot with performance appraisals and a whole host of newer names that have been introduced when people don't want to use performance management and performance appraisal. So for the purposes of our listeners today, can you tell us what, in your view, performance management is? You're right, Mary. It it can be a a maligned term. It can be used to refer to an appraisal. It can also be used um, in pejorative words in terms of managing people out of a business, which is why sometimes um, it's a loaded term. But for me, performance management or people and performance management is a strategic tool and it's a process that would sit within your organisation, which would encompass goal setting, one-to-ones, development, appraisals, essentially good and, and career aspirations potentially so it's a an annual process but that doesn't mean once a year it should really be about embedding great people management processes in your organization which is going to help your people perform at their best and your business in term in turn sorry deliver its best as well Right. Yeah, you've touched on some really key and interesting aspects of performance management And one of the things that I would like to highlight is the fact that it's not an annual process. It's not about when you're due to issue bonuses. That is when or at the beginning of the year for most organizations or their financial year, when managers sit down with their employees and go, right, let's do your performance management. That is not it at all. Is really a process which touches on all the various aspects that you've just mentioned and invariably is a continuum 
how you interact with your people, how you manage them, how you make sure that you get the best out of them through performance and how you as the manager or your lead, the leader of your organization support them to really be at their best. Absolutely. And, and I think ultimately as HR independents, we are working with a range of organizations and we want to help enable those organizations to achieve their strategic goals. And most organizations achieve their goals through their people. And if you look at what the, the evidence of, as to what actually drives high performance and employee engagement, it's the way in which people are managed. And that is about giving people really clear goals and regular feedback. So an appraisal is just a summary, is almost an, you know the conclusion of that sort of thing. What we want to be doing is having regular people conversations, quality people conversations throughout the year. And that's what good quality performance management is all about. And that's what's going to help your businesses. And I think most of the HRI people are supporting smaller businesses. Often, I think this is where as a business is starting to mature, let's say it's going from about 15 people to sort of 50 people. That's the point at which you need to start having some professionalization, some processes in there. And it's about giving those people managers the right skills and something like a performance management process, which, as you say, Mary, it's not just a, an end of year appraisal for a point of assigning bonuses or, or otherwise. It's actually something that's going to help people perform throughout the year, which in turn will drive your business forwards. Right. So someone's listening and we've picked their interests and they are wondering, OK, how can I actually do this in practice? Mm -hmm. How can I use performance management as a strategic tool? Absolutely. So I suppose from a strategic tool point of view, you want to align with you, you want to make sure that the business that you're working with, they have clarity of goals. Very often when I work with smaller businesses, um, the leaders know where the business should go they've got a business plan they've maybe got some goals but they may not have communicated it with the rest of the business the risk of that is that people are you know especially in smaller businesses it's a bit frantic you know it's it, everyone's sort of running as fast as they can but they might be running in different directions so really performance management is a way in which we align everybody's performance so everyone is driving you know, they're working really hard, but they're working in the right direction for your business. So that's a really key one. Start with making sure that the business understands what the strategic goals are. And then something about making sure that they spell out what good people management looks like and give your people managers the right skills and the clarity as to what a quality performance management process might look like. What I found is with a number of the businesses that I've worked with, often they're putting something in for the first time, or maybe they're moving from just like a paper based or a word document onto a system. And we found that we have a structure that works really quite nicely for, it's, if I describe it as a clock face, Mary, hopefully you can visualize it, which has really helped a number of businesses work out how to make performance management a year round activity. So it's almost spelling it out, what you need to, to be strategic, people need to be clear about what the expectations are and what activities to do when. So I mentioned earlier, you need to make sure that from a business point of view, everybody understands what the strategic goals and our objectives are that we want to achieve as a business in this financial year. We then want to cascade those or make sure that everybody has clear objectives which are aligning and supporting those. Obviously, you want to make set those at the start of the year or agree those with people at the start of the year so they know what's expected of them. But we don't just do it at the start of the year and never look again. So depending on the natural business that you're in, there's a natural cadence. Some people have one-to-one -one meetings weekly, monthly, minimum quarterly. So if I've said that you know quarterly, they say that was 12 o'clock at the start of the year. At the end of quarter one, then I would suggest that we should have a check-in or a one-to-one -one where we review those objectives. We see how we're getting on with those objectives and there may be that we're struggling or we've got a few development areas. So for me, that's a really good time to talk about development. And I, I mentioned I'm learning a development background. I always thought it was quite interesting in the old days when we had appraisals at the end of the year, you'd get to the end of the year and say, well, what development do you want? And it was kind of like, what's the point? Really development, strategically, our development should be helping us to perform. So that's the right time to say, what support or development do you need? And can we put it in place? And are those objectives relevant? You know, businesses change very quickly. So then that's, that's your development review, let's say at the end of quarter one. At the mid-year point, 
then that's a really good time to take stock, like a mini appraisal. It's also can be a really good time to talk about behaviours. So if you're really trying to embed certain values or competencies, maybe that's a good time to talk about how people are performing against those. Again, always want to review our objectives, always be prepared to give feedback and support in terms of making sure our objectives are on track. And you mentioned earlier bonus. If you are doing something like performance related pay, it's really important that you give people an indication of whether they're on track or not at that half year point, because you want people to be motivated and able to get to the end of the year and know where they are. No surprises at the end of the year. And then going forward to quarter three, at three, sort of nine o'clock in my clock face analogy, that's getting towards the end of the year. We really want to make sure we're retaining that top talent. That's a really good time to talk about career aspirations, or what people want next year. So keeping them interested, showing that you value them and having that conversation there. And then finally, you get to the end of the year and you wrap it up and, and do a sort of classic end of year appraisal. It shouldn't be one of those really painful epics because you've been talking all year round. And also it shouldn't take that much longer, really, because what we're really doing is breaking down the old fashioned three hour epic appraisal that we've all had, Mary. Um, And I know you've got NHS links in there. Some of the, the longest appraisal forms I've ever seen are in the NHS. And we're breaking it down into four chunks, right, which are much more palatable, much more meaningful. And actually it's supported by the evidence that really you talk about performance You should talk about performance at a different time from when you're talking about development and career. They are different topics of conversation and you can really focus in and make them engaging. So that process I've um, put in place with a number of businesses and it works really well, particularly if you're implementing things for the first time, because people can see the logic and it breaks it down and makes it really simple. You just have four relatively simple meetings with slightly different purposes, but put them all together. You've got a nice performance management process. That is an incredibly useful way to get people to visualize the performance management process, Lucinda. So thank you for that. And we do have where, as you said, done well, there should never be any surprises. And you can actually quite nicely align it with your your other HR processes and policies and stuff that you have in place. And again, someone is performing as expected they should know their manager should know and these conversations should really affirm that if someone is exceeding expectations then the same way it should be evident to both the manager and the employee that they ex- exceeding expectation and in the unfortunate event that someone is underperforming Again, it should be very clear through these conversations that the person is underperforming. And one of the reasons why I'm kind of taking my time to go through exceeding at expectation and below expectation is the fact that a lot of the time we find that managers find it easier if someone is performing at expected level or exceeding to have those conversations But when the uh, the person for any reason is underperforming, they find it quite difficult to have those difficult conversations because it can be quite uncomfortable sitting with somebody, whether face-to-face or virtually, and saying to the person, especially for the first time, that you are not quite performing as expected, isn't it? It's a really interesting point that, Mary, I do a lot of training on managing underperformance. And I think that the interesting point about that is that, in my opinion, underperformance is actually very often down to the line manager and or, or the organisation, because if the because the most common cause of underperformance is lack of clarity. And if no one has sat down and told you, well, A, if you've not got any objectives, how are you supposed to know what's you know, what you're supposed to do? If you have got objectives and you haven't been told that you know you're on track or what you need to do to achieve those objectives if they're either unachievable or you don't have the skills or the coaching or whatever it is then again that's a development need so no I would say no one wakes up wanting to be an underperformer what we need to do is, is you know sometimes as managers we're scared we beat around the bush but actually if we're having conversations 
business as usual and again so at least quarterly you're sitting down how are we doing about this and you know are you on track do you think you're on track coaching conversation what do we need or what support do you need to get on track with that objective those sort of conversations it doesn't get to the point where someone's an underperformer and we don't want to talk about it so it's being non-British right it's getting a little bit direct and clear and talking to people about you know what does good look like and helping people to perform and actually that ties back into it's all very well having your performance management process but do your managers have the confidence and the skills to wrap around those processes and you know if you're small supporting and say a, a, an SME let's say that's just going through a growth phase really important to Give them that training because very often those people, it's not like going into a large business. I worked in big blue chips and you've got processes baked in and you've got people, really experienced people managers in lots of cases who had formal training. That's often not the case in an SME. So giving people and often the leaders as well. So entrepreneurs are not necessarily the best people to model great people management behaviors. So we can really help them by showing them what good people management looks like. So that is also one of them, but making sure they've got the processes and the managers have the skills to help that organization mature and grow and perform. Absolutely. And yes, you, you've touched on the point there, which I think for any manager who is listening to this, I think Lucinda has got a very good point around, yes, if managers are, are trained and the processes are in place and are well the, the processes They are aware of how to have difficult conversations because let's face it, it's not going to be hunky-dory every single time. There will be times where things are not going as smoothly or as correctly or rightly as we would hope or would like. And those things need to be addressed and they need to be addressed on time so that it doesn't become, let's say for argument's sake, something goes wrong today and you say nothing to me about it and two months later you go oh Mary do you remember when we're having that conversation chances are that I wouldn't exactly and that's another reason to document I mean I'm sure I'm preaching to the converter talking to you Mary you'll have said this sort of thing till you're blue in the face but whenever I'm training people on uh, managing the forms it's about documentation and and capturing this information and, and on a regular basis and a, a little plug that's where if you've got a system like actors then you can capture your notes against objectives or you can capture your one-to-one so you've got a document trail it's not about catching people out but it's about being clear so people truly understand what's expected and you help them to be on track and to deliver their best so it's not a clarity issue but you've also got it documented so that if you do need to come back to it it isn't a case of, oh, no, I don't remember it. It was sufficiently formal, but more of a business as usual. That's what, you know, it should be feedback, business as usual. This is what we need to do to get back on track. So we're not trying to catch people out. We're trying to help people to deliver their best. Uh, well, once again, one of the benefits of using a tool such as Actors is the fact that it enhances transparency as well, because more often than not, it's not just a system that, most systems, it's not just a case of just the manager and HR have access to these, but the employee can also see in real time what information the system holds about them in terms of their performance management and other um, aspects of it. And actually, I'm a strong advocate of employees taking ownership of their own personal development and invariably their performance as well. So that the onus is not on the manager to say, oh, you need to do this, you have to do this and you have to do that all the time. But you as the individual is also interested in what you're doing, how you are doing it and invariably the outcome. Absolutely, get you and to encourage that ownership And again, making it really visible for people so things are not being done to them. And also, again, that is down to the style of the manager, making sure they have the skills and the confidence to be a coach rather than a a dictator, if you like, in terms of things. So that's what you really want to be empowering people to, you know, very few businesses feel like they've got so much extra resource you know, that they want to be managing every way that we want people to be empowered and to take ownership and to be motivated. And again, using performance management in an appropriate way, giving people real clarity about what's expected, the right support, 
coaching them to deliver their best and recognizing them let's not forget recognizing success reinforcing success you know nipping issues in the bud that maybe are, are less less the issues that you want those so are nipping perform potential performance issues in the bud before they become an issue before they become a problem that's the sort of thing that we want to be doing yeah um that touches on the next point which i'm going to touch on um which i want to address which is effectively someone a manager probably a business leader an entrepreneur listening to us today might go or an hr consultant who is working with an sma who is going I'd love to put this in place, but every time I bring it up, my client says, or the leaders in the organization say, well, it's all um, well and good trying to put all these HR nice to have soft, fluffy practices and processes in place. I'm busy. I've got other things to do. And you are expecting me to have what a minimum of for meetings a year with somebody about their performance alone, when are they going to get a chance to do their job? Mm -hmm. And that is a common thing that comes up a lot when it comes okay. to it. So to those people listening to us and questioning how much time we are advocating that it's we put or they put into the performance management process, what would you say the absolute benefits of doing this and getting these rights are? Well, again, so if you look at where we did a research review, and by the way, I'll send some links if anyone wants to download any of these sorts of things. We've got lots of resources on the Access website. And one of the things was a research review of where what correlates, what HR behaviours correlate with business performance. And for sure, it's giving objectives and regular feedback drives business performance that is that stands up in terms of that so if we think as line managers if you're going to employ people that you can't talk to people set objectives or give feedback well you, you might as well not employ people to be honest but I do get that it's time consuming or it can feel time consuming actually I, I would argue that the most time consuming is having a performance issue so if you are baking in good quality people performance management processes business as usual I'm I would argue that that let's say it's an hour a quarter you could get away with an hour and a quarter in terms of your objective setting now that's now I don't think that's optimum I think you should be having check-ins in between those in terms of how people are getting on etc but it does depend on the role but really what you're doing is you're extent taking an activity that if you do it once a year feels quite arduous you're not up to date with where things are and actually it could take a good two good couple of hours right so you're not really taking any extra time by doing this throughout the year but the other thing is I, I would really think about what is the purpose of the line manager role okay so is the line manager role there to go and do your day job it does depend on how many people they report but if you're a line manager you've got eight direct reports for argument's sake well a key part of your role is achieving results through your people it's not you as an individual contributor and being really clear on the fact that part of that role, therefore, is some of your time must be spent managing your people. That's going to stop you. You know how long it takes, Mary, if you have got somebody who you're having to manage out of a business or has got a performance issue or goes on long term sick. So this is prevention. It's that whole sort of a stitch in time. And it is a key part of professionalizing an organization that's also therefore going to drive employee engagement we all know that engagement uh, companies with higher engagement have better retention. It's very expensive and time consuming to recruit people. They have better productivity. In fact, almost any metrics that you want to look at, if you've got employee em engaged employees, you're going to have better business performance. How do you get engaged employees? Just look at the Gallup Q12 questions. It's all about, I know what's expected of me at work. Someone cares about me at work. My, my manager values me as an individual. I get opportunities to learn and grow. All of those things sit within a good performance management process. So put performance management in, get your managers to do it in a meaningful way, not lip service. And that is going to drive engagement, productivity and performance. So it's an investment. Absolutely. So what you're advocating for is an organization that totally embeds performance management into the culture, into the way you do things in your workplace. And it doesn't need to be ideas. It doesn't need to be extensive. It needs to be meaningful to both the manager doing it and to the employee 
who is being effectively uh, managed by that manager. And I also want to touch on the two-way process aspects of performance management, because from the conversation we have in, again, it may sound like, okay, or the manager, but for performance management to be effective is an absolute two-way process. I totally and, agree. Uh, and it, ownership. You want ownership, don't, don't you? And again, if you are a manager of eight people, you want the individual to write up the one-to-one -one notes. You want the individual to propose their objectives because then they're more invested in them and buying them. And so 100%, you want it to be two-way, ideally, you know, almost bottom up, if you can encourage that, because you're going to get people who are thinking for themselves that they are bought into what it is that they are focusing on. And the way you do that is by asking open questions rather than telling. So getting managers to be able to share the vision. This is where the business is going. How do you think you can best contribute? What should you focus on in your role? Getting ideas from others. That can feel like that takes more time, of course. So again, if you're in a hurry and Lots of people, particularly in small businesses, do feel in a hurry because they've got lots of conflicting demands. But it is an investment that if that person has clarity and is brought into those objectives, they are going to perform better. It's a, teaching someone to fish, isn't it? It's that kind of thing. So it's a good investment of time. Totally agree. Two way for sure. And if you can delegate to your, you know, your employees to write things up, after all, it's their development, it's their performance, then that's even better. Yeah, and it also creates room for example, if I set myself a goal to go to the moon next month and then you are my manager and you think, okay, that is an interesting goal, but to start off with, that is not or it doesn't feed into any key objective of organisation. That needs to be addressed. How my aspiration, my goal, my dream to go on the moon next month fits in or doesn't fit in with what the organization is trying to do. And in this example, the fact that it doesn't fit in at all needs to be addressed. And we need to then be able to work on a goal that really fits into the organization's goals, which may well be, I don't know, increase profitability by 10% by ensuring that we improve our customer service or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that's interesting if you think about accommodating people's career aspirations. So that's, that's, if that's an aspiration for you to go to the moon. And sometimes you do have people in a business that you know you're not going to keep them forever. But if you can keep them engaged, so I might be saying, OK, Mary, I know that your long term vision is to go to the moon. But what are the steps along the way that you might want to do there? And, and we say, well, actually, I need to have the right outfit i need to have the right astronauts outfit or rockets or design so okay well how can we align that with where we're going so can we look at so in, you know in our organization we need to have more streamlined engineering products i mean we're, we're stretching the analogy but the point of the line manager is to go okay get that's where you want to go it might not be where we're going right now but where's the commonality in terms of you developing skills that you want to develop but while still contributing to the business and i think being a bit creative particularly in an sme because usually there are loads of things that need to be done so it's actually it's really interesting you you want to do that you could go and do some research on this project which would help us to do xyz so not just thinking within the confines of a, the actual role if you can find something that you're excited about that will add value to the business, don't get me wrong, you've still got to do the day job. By the way, these objects are still going to be delivered. You've still got to answer the phone or whatever it is that you're here to do. But can we you know, give you an objective which actually will take you vaguely in the direction that you want to? You see it's fulfilling, but it's also supporting the business. So being creative, I think, is quite good as a manager there as well. Yes, it's being creative. And I know sort of I gave an on like... Uh, an example which most people will go, why would you put that in your performance management, but in your performance management goals? But I have come across scenarios where the individual's goals and the organizational goals or where the manager thinks the goals should be have been an absolutely like opposites or clashed. And that then needed to be resolved in a way that yes we need to support your goals your aspirations but for you to be able to excel within your role within this organization these are the sort of things that we also would expect of you 
Yeah, again, it goes down to clarity though, right? At the end of the day, we're here to do a job and the business needs you to do a specific job. And if that's what you've been employed to do, you need to be, you know, you need to know what it is that's expected, going back to clear objectives and to perform against it. And if you don't want to do that, occasionally you do get people in the wrong job or, or a job kind of a business outgrows them or something, then actually being clear about what that job is about, what the expectations are, if that doesn't suit, it's so much better for someone to either move into a different role within the organisation, which is your ideal, but maybe it is right for them to move on and you have someone who is in the right job. Because the, the, the worst thing is having someone who is mentally quit but stayed. That's what you do not want in a business. You want people who, who want to do the job that you need them to do. And that's the key. Thank you, Lucinda. And for people who may be listening and thinking, well, the only time I hear of performance management is when I'm not performing or something isn't going right and the business wants to get rid of me, they get HI involved and they go, oh, I need to be performance managed. So for some people, it has a negative connotation. Mm. How can we convince them that it's not a negative, but an essential tool? Well, I, I guess there's a, a, part of it is about the process that you put in place and putting something in and relabeling it and working strategically as we started thinking about it. But sometimes you might engage with an organisation where there really is a, a negativity to it. And I know you could argue it's a bit of smoke and mirrors, but maybe looking at rebranding it, using things, engaging with people, asking them what they want, what would help them to perform. So presenting something as you know a, a new process that people have said that they want. So listening to people if they feel negatively about it and re-educating them as to what something's there to do. And sometimes just the language. And actually, it was interesting language. I've thought about this earlier. I just mentioned less point. So I've had people talk, but they don't talk about appraisal anymore. They talk about it as an achievement review, right? That's quite a nice term because it's sharing that it's already sort of presupposing that you've achieved. So you can use different language in your organisation. You can rebrand your process. I, one of the companies I work with, they call it I Perform because they've got another system, which is I Develop or whatever. So I Perform. So think about the language. And equally, if you are doing something like ratings, think about the language that you use in ratings because people don't like to be called average. And I'm quite often the middle <laughs> rating of something is, is average or something. So whereas you can say meets expectations. That's so much more positive. So a lot of what we do, it can feel like the language doesn't always help us. And that's what we're talking about. So being alert to that and considering choosing a different set of terms or messaging that might, you know, give it the image that you're after. Right. And on the language thing, you've touched on potentially talking to people, conducting survey, finding out what your employees want and what language will be more acceptable to your workforce in terms of around performance management, around their expectations, around what they want from the business mm -hmm. uh, as well. So that is the bottom up or the other side of the coin bit is really what's in it for the employee from their point of view, you touch on it's feeding directly into your personal development, your professional development, your career aspirations, et cetera. And actually the beauty of a good practice performance management process is the fact that when an employee gets to the point where they think, actually I'm alpha grown or I'm outgrowing this role, or I'm bored with this role, or I can't really do this anymore. It's very obvious to them, and it helps them to focus on, so what's next for me? And even if it means, okay, it's time that I dusted off my resume and start looking somewhere, that might be the outcome for them, rather yeah. than have somebody in a role who's absolutely unhappy who isn't doing their best, they've lost interest in the role and they are in there and that is not healthy for them or for the organisation or for anyone else. Absolutely. It's having those honest conversations with people though, isn't it? And spotting that. And sometimes it's the right thing for people to move on. We've had loads of people work in our business and, you know, it's 
yeah, if you've got somebody, they've outgrown the role and, and in a small business, you can't always show a direct career progression, then helping them to go positively. And that's really important for a small business because you don't want people just to hang on and then and they get really just frustrated and then they give you minimum amount of warning. So, they, so they've got a four week notice and they give the four weeks, you're like, oh, you can't recruit in four weeks, can you? Whereas actually, if you're talking to someone and you know they're going to get to a point where actually they're going to outgrow it, so sort of say, it really helped me. I understand you're going to start looking at it. it. really would help me if you give us at least six weeks notice or we could do handover or that sort of things. And, you know, and, I'll, and supporting them to make their next step, right? Because people don't stay in the same organisation forever, right? What you want is to have people in the right role for the right amount of time in your organisation. And if it's time for them to move on, help them leave positively so they feel positive about the business positive about the way they've been managed and also ideally so that they can line it up so it's easy for you to um, replace that role or to for someone to pick up because there's lots of knowledge is going to go with someone again in a smaller business it's almost more risky because lots goes in, in people's heads processes may not be quite as established so it can be really quite tricky to to lose people so which is why you want them to be good levers to you know to work with you to leave in a positive on a positive note and maybe help you even replace them and so that everything continues to flow once they've moved on to their next exciting chapter yeah, thank you for that, Lucinda. And the other thing, the last thing that I probably would like us to touch on before you give us your top tips for performance management is we've touched on it a couple of times in this conversation around bonuses. And I know that different schools of thought around whether performance management should be linked into bonuses and vice versa, or they should be kept separate. What's your view on it? Cool. What's my view? I, I am minded, all right. I've worked in an organisation where you have performance-related pay and performance bonuses, and I've worked in organisations where you get paid more by getting older, all right? There are pros and cons to both of those, those situations. What I think is very important if you are going to do performance-related pay is it's got to be transparent and I say transparent in terms of the fact that people do have clear objectives um, and it's open and honest. I don't like people being rated in secrecy. You've got to be having open and honest conversations with people. And realistically, it happens more in financial services and people are more accustomed to it. But realistically, if you are below a certain number of people, you're not going to get a normal distribution. Right. So, net, so you, 100 people is the minimum that you're going to get a normal distribution. So you can't expect a curve to distribute and pay. And this is where it gets tricky because, you know, what do you pay the people who are slightly underperforming? Do you want to demotivate people? So for me, you've got to think about if you're going to do that, what's the purpose of using performance related pay? And, you know, it does that fit in your organization and is that compatible? And you want to try and make it as motivational as possible and as clear and transparent as possible and make sure you have something in place, which is some sort of calibration or moderation approach where um, individuals, man managers, ratings are sort of looked at in the round. And that's what I would say is, is important in terms of that. I do feel that there's less of it going on now. I feel that it's not as common as it used to be. And if you are going to do something like that, maybe again, this is a top tip. If you are going to do performance um, related pay, that's where I think it is really important to split out the performance conversation, going back to my clock face. So you're talking about objectives and performance at 12 o'clock and six o'clock, and then split that out from the engagement conversation, which is at three o'clock and nine o'clock, because there's a CIPD report, which I think they call it could do better, which just shows that those are not compatible in the same conversation. So you're supposed to be motivating people with development and um, career aspirations. But if in the same breath, you're going to say, mm, actually, but I'm only going to give you a two out of five, doesn't fit. So you need to think quite carefully about what your annual process looks like if you're going to do it. Right. Thank you very much. It's a topic that we can probably sit all day and talk about, but we got to wrap it up. And if you can briefly give us where your top three tips will be to businesses and HR consultants in putting in a good performance management process. 
Okay, first of all, get buy-in from the senior leaders and the managers and make sure that they are going to at least model the behaviours that you're asking to put in and they see the link with the, and they're going to talk about it strategically and see how this is important. Because if they're not going to, if they're going to live lip service, you probably might as well not bother. Okay, so do talk to those. Be very clear about the purpose of it. Make sure you've got some positive, purposeful messaging. Be clear about it in terms of that and also train your line managers as to what's expected in each area of those. And the third one is, Think of it as a culture change. You're not going to get people to um, do a brilliant job if they've never done it before in year one. Think about it as something that's probably going to take two to three years to embed really well. So don't expect that, you know, one appraisal and everything is going to happen. So it's a process. A process takes a while to embed. So those would be my three things. Involve the leaders. Be really clear about the expectations on each of them and make sure your managers are, understand that and have the skills and think of it as a culture change. Great. Thank you so much, Lucinda, for joining us. And thank you for a very engaging and interesting conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Mary. Great. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Please, if you want to hear about a specific topic, do email us, get in touch with us at hrvoices at hrindependent.co.uk. And also do subscribe and encourage others to listen to and subscribe to the podcast. Thank you. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of HR Voices. If you have a topic you'd like us to cover or would like to be a guest, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on social media or email us at hrvoices at hrindependence.co.uk. Tune in next time.